Hello and welcome to this next session. Back in 2006, British mathematician and Tesco marketing mastermind Clive Humby declared that data is the new oil. In the years that followed, companies such as Facebook and Google have clearly reaped the benefits of their data land grab and others have followed suit. But there have been growing concerns recently over privacy and the security of data, with US President Biden recently warning companies to expect a rise in cyber attacks. Other changes, such as the implementation of GDPR and the end of third-party tracking technology like cookies, have changed the landscape again. Yet, as The Economist John Glenn said this morning, understanding your customer needs will be critical as we enter a period where household budgets will be squeezed for the next decade. And data remains a hugely important tool for understanding customers, from what drives them to why they buy the brand. So in this ever-evolving environment, what does good data look like for businesses today? I've got two expert speakers here to talk about this topic. We have Jessica Jacobs, who's the Global Director of Incubator, who has worked with some of the largest global brands, including L'Oreal, Accor, and Qatar. And I have Tom Hares, who used to work at Apple and is the founder and chief exec of Buzzbike, which is a direct-to-consumer business with an ambition to make it as easy as possible to get around the city on a bike. So hello to you both. Um, to start, can you tell us a little bit about your business and why data is so important for your success? And I'll start with Jessica. Yeah, perfect. Hello, everyone. So um, kind of diving in immediately into why this is so important. Working with some of the largest advertisers today, it is no surprise that for them in order to actually enrich or understand their consumers today, they really need to understand data. So from my perspective, what Incubita is focusing on is really trying to understand our clients through better understanding their consumers. So essentially, we always need to be ahead of the curve in terms of what data is all about and where data is all heading to. Perfect. Tom? Yeah, and I, I come from this from a slightly different um, perspective. Um, it scares me slightly to be described as a, a data expert, and I, I'll explain, explain why. Um, as Kate said, I started out my life um, working in advertising for, for, for Apple and was lucky enough to go on a huge journey with Apple six months pre-iPhone. Um, I, I joined an agency which was 100% focused on Apple. Um, and the big irony of, of Apple was that we were very, very focused on brand advertising. And we, we, didn't, um, uh, we didn't focus on huge amounts of um, digital at that point. Steve Jobs very much wanted to control the conversation. And for him, what that meant was um, outdoor uh, TV. Um, and uh, we eventually got to do something crazy like that banner ads. Um, but then I've, um, after to 10 years um, of doing that, start out my own business and um, being a founder of a um, growth consumer company, um, I've had a huge education in terms of the um, importance of data-led decision-making and, and data-led um, marketing and, and growth. Um, so now it really does um, impact everything that, that we do in terms of the decisions that we make. And also I would say, and we'll come on to this a bit later on, the, the hires that we make, um, data is central to everything we do. And that's um, you know, been a huge journey and a big, a big change um, for me personally. Mm, that's really interesting. Jessica, have you seen a similar change from that kind of traditional ad advertising approach to now much more a data-driven um, one as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, the concept of data-driven has been uh, has been kind of following us for a really long time. I don't think anybody really took it that seriously or the requirement of it, yet we've all been collecting data. And I think things like happening like COVID has definitely accelerated the need for us to adopt to data. Um, and everybody's kind of changing to this data-driven mindset. The concern more is, or the question is, I'm, I'm not really sure if everybody understands the, the, the really the detail of what is required to change for data. Mm -hmm. so tell, tell me, what, what do businesses get wrong when they try and use a data-driven approach? I, I think one of the, the first things that I've seen is we're, we're trying to take very traditional molds um, or, or molds that have existed for many years and trying to just move it into this data, this data future or this, or this new era that we're moving into. And it doesn't actually quite fit. Um, there is so much more to it. Yes, we sit on heaps and heaps of data that we've been collecting for years, but there's, it's been a certain type of personality been, that's been collecting that data for, for these large advertisers. And one of the biggest mistakes I see is that advertisers are not really taking the time to create the culture in organizations that go along with data, which is why I think there's this rapid concern for 
protecting our data and making sure that everybody knows what it takes in order to actually activate or, or, or protect consumer data in a smart way, because we're not actually taking the foundational steps of creating the cultures within organizations or within schooling systems even. Mm, um, so what would that look like to take those steps? I think it's, 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 you know, it's going back to the foundations of things. Um, we're trying to kind of leap ahead and, and I can understand why. Data is ex extremely rewarding if you get it right. Uh, it's relevant, it gives you a lot more insight, it converts better. But I think before we jump or leapfrog straight into activation, let's look at what does it actually take to bring this stuff together in a smart ecosystem. And we have to start with education. So what are the foundational steps that, that everybody in an organization needs to understand in order to activate data in a much more smarter way? And I think by doing those steps, we'll have a, probably a much more safer data future, as well as the way that we're collecting it, like unnecessarily, but also in a sustainable way. So you think people are trying to brush too quickly to the end point and actually they need to put in the steps at the beginning to kind of create Absolutely. that. I think we're still guilty of wanting to collect everything and anything. Um, we're not really asking what we should be collecting and what are we doing with what we are collecting. And I think it saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of effort in terms of actually storing this data. So it, it almost seems silly to ask the question to, to go through much more deeper discovery. But I think that is what is needed. Spend the time to discover what your data should look like. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can um, talk to that a little bit too, I think, um, in terms of, I guess, um, having this uh, rare opportunity to be setting up a, a company from scratch. We're a few years old now, um, but it gave us an opportunity to right from the start go, okay, so if we're going to be a data-led culture, um, and that's a, you know, a, a term that's thr thrown around a lot, what does that really mean? Well, that means um, actually letting data make decisions in your in your day-to-day -day and removing a level of um, subjectivity and i think that what um i find interesting about um what we were just saying there is that um we have found ourselves in a situation where we are collecting an awful lot of data right there's um everything from um our, our mobile app that's collecting and um, people physically moving around um on their bikes right the way down through um collecting the um data from people that sign up about their intentions to, um, to ride, et cetera, down to you know, the, the, the typical um, data you might collect from advertising platforms. So we've got this whole wash of, of data. I, I think where um, uh, good uh, culture, uh, good data strategy starts to be required is, is starting to really ask yourself questions. Okay, we've got all this data. What are we, what are we actually doing with this? What are the really important pieces of data that we're, we're collecting? And are they really making are they making an impact in our core business, um, or are they just nice to have? And therefore, why why are we collecting them? And I think with the influx of, um, of GDPR, if you are just collecting it for the sake of collecting, you have to question like why are you wasting resources on doing that, and is that ethically um, correct to be to, to be doing it in the first place? And then the second piece around culture is um, I think is um, part of your recruitment strategy. Are you bringing people in across the board? Um, that um, are data first in their in their mentality. Are they actually making decisions based on data, or, or is it something that they that they can um, put on the CV? But when you actually ask them practically to go in and um, investigate and diagnose a situation based on data across across departments, I would say this is not just a specific um, group of people. Are they able to actually pull out insight and, and and drive change as a as a result of that? And I think that's like starting to get at what what we believe anyway. Um, good good data culture looks like. Mm, I think it's really interesting. So I think there's two points there. And the first is yeah, how do you know what data matters? Because it's so easy to collect everything and actually interpreting it is kind of probably the main skill, not necessarily the capture. So um, do you have any kind of specific advice, uh, Jessica and Tom, both on that point? Like how how do you know what data matters and what you should prioritize as a business? I mean, I I think it goes down to you know, speaking about what you're trying to achieve with it, um, you know, setting, planning your objectives and, and doing a bit of testing is what's going to make the difference. Now, you know, speaking coming from an agency environment, of course, testing is usually not the first go to that people want to do. They want to get things going, they want to get things live, and they want to be able to just kind of move on to, to the next project. But it's crucial for us to incorporate continuous learning into our day-to-day -day activities. Um, the only way that you're going to know what data truly matters and what data you're going to refine in the future is if you've done some sort of a test. So 
probably alongside this data culture with with it comes quite a level of structured thinking and and a bit of I would say operational success that has to be incorporated into it and we we often remove that operational side away from activation pieces because we've been so fast-paced in the last few years and I think it's time for us to kind of go back to some of these foundational steps that we used to take probably in the early stages of of digital marketing. Mm, interesting and Tom do you agree what, what how do you have you been kind of running your data strategy? Yeah, so I, I would say um, huge amounts of testing, as I, I would uh, would agree with. Um, I think the um, most important uh, word for us would be um, needle movers. So, um, are, are we collecting data that can create needle needle movers? So, there's huge volumes of experiments that we can spend our time doing, and um, huge amounts of resource that goes into it. Um, but actually having a clear um, strategy around um, what, what you're testing, why you're testing it, and a clear business case as to why this could be a needle mover based on, a, based on an experiment. Um, I think that's, that's when you're, you're using data really effectively. And you know, we've, we've had, we've had um, good, good examples of where we've, we've done that. Mm, I think that's a good point. So I'm sure a lot of businesses actually just think I can capture all this data. I'm just going to do it. And then at some point in the future, I'll look at it. But probably nobody ever does. And actually, as you say, it's taking resources away from it and it's stopping people from actually focusing on the key you know, measures. And actually, it's if you have to be much more targeted about your approach to begin with, it actually forces you to think about what actually matters in your business and what's really going to kind of, as you say, move the needle. And that's, mm. you know, right, forces you to prioritize, I guess, which is interesting. Um, so and the other area you mentioned there is about recruitment. Um, so I'm interested, do you set tests then for people that are coming in, um, sort of data-driven tests to say, can you actually look through this data and interpret it in a kind of, you know, good way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's part of a uh, interview process for someone coming into a growth role, um, and 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 certainly part of um, our, our process would be some kind of practical application. So uh, again, and not being um, too cynical, as lots of people that say, "Oh, you know, I was involved in um, this experiment that did X, Y, and Z for for, for the business," um, but the reality is, at whatever level um, um, of a of a growth hire, um, they should be able to go in and look at a, a data set, diagnose an issue. Um, and um, come back with a hypothesis as to what, what's happened in, in that particular data set and then a point of view of what experiment um, or next step that should be taken. Um, and I think that um, if I'd say you're hiring a, a, a senior um, growth hire and there was a pushback against doing that, I'd say that that was a, probably a problem. Um, because you know, if someone's just like, oh, I'm, and I, I work in a more strategic role, I, I, I wouldn't be doing that. Um, particularly, I suppose, a, a growth stage business like us, I'd be concerned about that because I think that it's not necessarily that they would be coming in and doing that, but they need the ability to really understand the data in a in a more meaningful way. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any kind of practical examples of that? Like, do you have any specific examples of a sort of set of data that somebody might be asked to analyze? So I think um, one of the sort of scenarios might be, um, okay, so look at um, signups over um, the last uh, two weeks. Um, there's been a, a massive drop off in um, active subscriber levels um, mm -hmm. and the, the, the terminology becomes really important. So are they go then going in and, and they, are they just looking at acquisition numbers? Are they, or, or are they going in and they're, they're looking at um, uh, churn rates as well? Um, and therefore, they're looking at um, the, the difference in net active subscriber levels. So it's sort of like trying to like keep, pull it all apart um, mm -hmm. and then diagnose the issue off of that. And it, it might be something like um, actually we saw a, a massive drop off um, in acquisition levels on, on Friday because the, it looks like there was some sort of like system outage or whatever it might be. But it's like really getting granular about that. And it's, it's more about um, less about them solving the actual uh, problem, if you like, but more about watching how they dissect all the all of the different data sets to be able to, to diagnose an issue and potentially um, propose that the, that the right next step. Mm, that's really interesting. I think particularly there's probably specific skills you're looking for as well as a, as a growth, small growth business that's in the kind of early sort of stages that, you, yeah, as you say, somebody in a more traditional business or in a kind of further along business might be able to avoid. Jessica, do you, do you agree with that? Is, is it 
about recruitment and are you looking for different skills in people? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think um, what's really important to understand is that the entry level has changed. Um, I think we've all been kind of lucky to evolve with digital and the entry level in some cases were quite low, but, but it's definitely taken a knock up. So yes, of course, there will be highly expert levels um, who will need a, a much higher level of understanding of how to interpret data and how to use it. But I think every single person in entering into this part of an organization, doesn't matter where which organization it is, needs to have a foundational level of understanding how data is controlled, how data needs to be analyzed, and how data needs to be treated. Um, and, and, you know, you can speak to almost any country, but every single country is now adopting some sort of a stricter law around data usage. So you can see it's becoming a fundamental part of our industry. So the entry level is bumped up. It's all down to recruitment now. There needs to be some level of testing to understand if whomever you are recruiting has got this the sound level of understanding they need. Mm, that's interesting. And you mentioned there about, you know, there's obviously a big... Um, a big debate about data and trying to capture too much of it and it kind of gets into lots of problems both from a security and from a privacy perspective so just on the morality of it and the kind of privacy perspective how can businesses make sure that they are um collecting data in a, in a responsible way in a way that consumers actually understand what's happening because we've all seen those privacy policies that you know 25 pages long full of legalese and no one understands um do you think Think that it's a kind of moral imperative from businesses to make sure their customers do understand the data that they're using and do you think that's a kind of growth area in the future yes i mean i, I mean of course from a customer service perspective i would say that there's a level of responsibilities that you know brands will have to their customers but there's also a level of responsibility that you will have to yourself as an individual you know accessing a lot of this brand content via on you know online facilities or via your mobile um so there's a part, there's a foundational step that we as, as any citizen needs to take to understand what data laws mean. And I think some countries are taking good steps to, to protect us in a sense. But a lot of efforts that brands are already taking, and I think this, the, this is, is, is a really big effort from brands to have to do so, is all of a sudden re-establishing re what their data frameworks look like. Um, you know, asking for consent, making sure that they're masking a lot of their customer data. Uh, they're being more respectful in terms of how they're re-advertising to them, giving them more relevant content. So there's, there's a lot of different ways or steps that advertisers have already taken it. And I don't even think consumers understand the full gist of it. Unless you're in our industry, will you probably fully understand the steps that we've probably already had to take? Mm, it's interesting. Tom, do you comment on that point on the privacy? Because obviously you have got lots of data on customers. How how are you making sure that you're doing that in a responsible fashion? Well, I, I think um, about having a, a principle and a framework uh, around it is the, is, is the first point. And I think you only have to look at the sort of um, big tech giants as the, the, the two examples of um, doing things philosophically very differently to, to kind of illustrate, I guess, how, how we approach it. So if we, um, Tim Cook at Apple saying, um, you know, um, publicly, many years ago before even actually this was a bigger debate as it is now is that um, your data is not a revenue stream um, and that was a you know that's a there's a very big um, standpoint that Apple has um, versus you know versus Facebook which is the you know the, the extreme um, other example which is actually you know mm -hmm. your data is the main revenue stream um, and, and so for, for, for us it's about being really clear about which side of the fence that we, we sit on so your data is not a revenue stream for us. So as much as you know, third parties um, might be interested in it from, let's say, insurance companies and um, um, health companies about you know, how often people are cycling, um, where are they cycling, what calories they burn, etc. Like that's a, a conscious decision that you know we're not we're not monetizing that. But the other mm -hmm. side is um, data to help improve your user experience. Um, that's a really different thing, uh, and and I think um, using collecting data about um, uh, what your goals are for cycling, how often you prepare to cycle, and then um, nudging people to say, hey, um, you know, like you're not cycling that much or, you know, you've, you decided you want to do this and you're not doing that um, uh, is, is, I guess, the, the more of the approach that, that, that we would take. Um, that said, I think there's, um, there's a hybrid that sits in between for us, which is um, uh, using it for, for commer like commercial reasons um, that help with something like churn uh, mitigation so um, health scoring is, is, is an example so you know uh, we've noticed x um, group of users um, are not cycling as much as they uh, would do uh, you're given an 
X health score um, warning effectively at that point. Um, and a bunch of mitigation activities is, is taken to, to question why those people aren't riding as much. And is that diagnosing that actually there's an issue and likely uh, in X months they will, they will churn. So I think there's ways to use data that sit like commercially in between. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's about being really transparent about where you sit and what you're using people's data for. No, that's really interesting because I think I'm also kind of conscious that I guess you're capturing almost real time data of people moving around the cities and stuff. And I think there's another obviously issue with the security around that, like what that gets hacked, et cetera. Um, obviously, that's just a basic thing. Every business should have those sort of protections in place. But do you see, I mean, perhaps, Jessica, do you see things um, that people just get wrong or, about this? And do you agree with Biden that this is going to be a kind of an area that people, businesses need to be pay increasing attention to? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think it's it's part of the natural evolution that we're going into. Um, it makes sense for us to pay more attention to it. But, you know, we're, we are a commercially driven world and we, we try to really only take the steps that are advantageous to the bottom line. Now, the first thing is we've got tons of applications that, that users are accessing today. And I think foundationally, a lot of businesses have probably already taken the step to, to secure it as much as they can. But we need to understand that the threats we had probably two or three years ago has, has doubled, if not tripled by now. And our efforts need to grow equally as fast. And I think that's the importance of understanding. Most businesses today already have frameworks in place to address security. But that security framework now needs to extend to a one-to-one -one person or personal conversation with your employees, the individual individuals using it, and then an ongoing framework to make sure that your, that your system stays secured. There's a ton more development technologies, which means that the rapid growth of these type of skill sets in your organization would also need to grow to combat any threat that's 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 organizations are going to be faced with. I, I, mm -hmm. think, I, think, it's, I think there's also, um, um, I, th I think your point earlier um, around, you know, individual responsibility is also is also really important. And with that individual responsibility comes the requirement for better education across the board. Uh, and, and I think that um, governments um, uh, are falling short on, on, on that in, in terms of actually really explaining to particularly, um, I think, um, younger people coming through schools, how, how data is being used, what it's being used for. Um, because, you know, what, what, what if I'm a if I'm a you know a 14 year old kid and I'm, I want to go on to TikTok because my mates are doing it, I've not necessarily understood at that point that TikTok is um, monetizing my data for advertising because I'm just not there yet in, in, in my life. But probably there's just a, a combination of you know the the the, the, the sanctions that are going to come and the you know, breaking up of some of these companies that's probably going to come. I think we all probably think that ultimately something like that is is, is going to happen but also how are we actually educating people around around data so they can make those better decisions individually mm -hmm. and i think it's not even teenagers i think it's a lot of ad adults that use those apps that don't really understand it either so yeah. it's yeah. interesting and we've got loads of questions coming in from the audience i'm just going to move on to them um first one is what would you recommend as the best analytics platform it's that's a that's a really tough one to say i think you know, to be honest, um, it's going to probably come down to what 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 you know best and what you trust the most. Um, do I all do I believe they all fundamentally probably would end up reporting back on the same thing? Absolutely, the functionalities and features they all seem to follow the same trend, and and I would say go with what you 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 are most conf confident with. Um, from an agency side, of course, we have expertise in multiple ones, so it's not that easy for us to say really which one's the best. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you use a specific one? Yeah, I mean, what, what I would say is, um, I mean, if I put it, put it from a sort of startup sort of phase, is don't go too soon into signing yourself up to um, expensive analytics platforms when the reality, the journey usually goes uh, uh, Sheets or Excel, which is where you're running everything um, in, in your business, um, then actually using something like um, Google Data, Data Studio, which actually works you know, really well for most of your purposes. And then eventually when you, when you actually need to really properly crunch the data, um, um, we've, we've kind of just about to, to move into something like this, that's something like Tableau, um, then becomes like a really powerful tool that's like looking across the whole of your business. But I think it's about uh, um, not rushing into an analytics platform because, you know, you want a nice da dashboard, really understanding what, what your data first, and then, then you can move on to what the, the right platform is. 
yeah, I think that's actually back to what we were talking about before, isn't it? Is working out what it is that you need and being able to have those interpreting skills are actually more important than necessary, the tools and the, what, what you're seeing. So no, it's good advice. Um, the next question is, um, what would you your advice be to smaller businesses that are looking to expand their use of data in generating growth and revenue in their business? What should they be mindful of? So specific question around smaller businesses here. I mean, I, I think... To be honest, I think it's almost easier for smaller businesses to get into the game of, of becoming a little bit more data focused because you, you can start off by just understanding what is the objectives that you want to achieve. A lot of the functionalities today to achieve smart data driven activation or growth uh, through campaigning is already part of probably their day to day media activities. So I start as easy as just saying, what do you want to achieve out of it? What data will enrich your activity today? And focus, really zoom in on just that one key point. Don't even look to try and capture everything else. The, everything else can come after that. Make that one part successful and then move from there. Good advice, Tom? I, I, yeah, and, and, and for us, it would be um, getting really clear on what your uh, North Star data point is and what your two or three top uh, KPIs that you really care about um, mm -hmm. and then dependent if it's a consumer business like we are um, it would also then just be getting go, going deep on the, the free um, platforms to really understanding uh, Google Analytics and, and that, there's a lot that you can do with that at, at, at the very start um, mm -hmm. but, but I think yeah making sure you're really clear on the, the data point you, you care about and I heard um, a podcast the other day um, from a guy that used to run growth for um, Uber and, and you'd expect it to be um, something terribly clever about what the North Star metric was when he first set it up um, and it was just active subscribers. So it doesn't always have to be this like, you know, mystic, um, uh, terribly intelligent data point. Often it's just like really having a lot of debate around what, what is that one point that we really care about and then how do we track it and how do we monitor it and how are we going to diagnose issues from it? Mm. How important do you think intuition is in all of this as well? Because obviously the date, there's lots of data there and it, from both, both of your points, it seems to be that the interpretation of that is the most important thing. So how important is sort of intuition, just human interaction and that kind of process? Like how, how much should you be led by the data is kind of my point. I mean, I, I also think it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but today, in all honesty, it, it's all about that. It's just too competitive to not make decisions based on the data that you are seeing. Otherwise, you're going to just kind of fall part of, you know, blindly putting a lot of advertising or a lot of effort in front of consumers and not really knowing what you're achieving from it. We, we are in the data led era. So it is important, but it's the understanding of what you do with it that's equally important. Otherwise, you will just be doing uh, probably a lot of everything and saying that you are data driven. Mm -hmm. and, and I think from our standpoint, because, you know, budgets are small, um, you know, the, the, you know, there's always like a, a runway to be thought about in terms of, you know, how much cash you got left in the bank, the, you know, where, where are you going to make your decisions based on gut, which is probably, I think, the, the world that I used to live in a little bit more like brand and a lot of like what, what we think is good and what um, maybe you did a little bit of research on an ad afterwards, but or are you going to make it based on, um, you know, what, what data is telling you and where you're going to put your money? And, and, you know, it's, that's, that's the reality. Of course, it's always going to be a combination of you know, art, art, art and science to a degree, but I think um, data leads, leads the conversation. Data leads, okay. And then my final question here, um, and we'll have to probably wrap up, but what metrics matter most when it comes to data and how do we move away from vanity metrics? Oh, um, I mean, I think this, this will highly depend on, on, on the business or the organization that you're speaking to, as well as, you know, what level of the funnel becomes their prim primary metric. But the ones I would definitely would like to see us focusing on are definitely the more conversion focused metrics, the growth metrics that you can see that clearly link back to your primary one. I'm not too bothered by, by organizations defining vanity metrics as part of their journey to their primary one, but I'm definitely hoping that we're going to move past a lot of these impression or, or click-based metrics being what organizations are so heavily still focused on. And, the, and it sounds a bit shocking to think that there are still organizations focused on metrics like that, but they are. The vanity metrics still seem to lead us slightly too much. Mm -hmm. I suppose that somebody feels like they've achieved something because there's that vanity metric and it's easy to, you know, easier to interpret that than it might be to kind of actually, as you say, interrogate the data and work out what's really going on. Um, yeah, Tom, do you agree with that? I, I, I do. And I, I would say that it is so specific to an organisation. So I'm like, 
four or five ones that we care about that I would say most subscription business are really caring about um, our um, lifetime value, active subscribers, um, net growth. Um, so it's a mean difference between uh, acquisition and, 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 and churn um, and, and then churn. Um, and I, I think those, those kind of myriad of, of, um, of, of KPIs are pretty much going to be um, going to be in there um, along with um, uh, AR, also annual recurring revenue. Like that, those are the sort of myriad of, 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 of um, metrics that you're going to care about if you're in a subscription business. Mm, that's interesting. Great. Well, I think thanks for your time. We're going to have to wrap up now, but that was a really interesting session. Thank you for your time. And um, good luck. No everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.